Hey, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Unchurned. I'm Josh Schachter, your host, founder and CEO of Update AI. We are here today with Jeff Ernst and Kaylee Basket. They come from Slap5, one of my favorite companies in Boston, one of my favorite SaaS companies, one of my favorite customer marketing and advocacy companies. And I'm really excited about today's episode because we haven't covered this topic yet. And we are going to be talking about customer-led growth. So without further ado, Jeff, Kaylee, welcome to the show. Right. Thank you. Thank you for having us today, Josh. Yeah, my pleasure. I want to... Name of our show, Unchurned. We want to get raw. We want to get to know you guys. So I'm going to start with a little fun, rapid fire. Jeff first. Go for it. Jeff, what's your favorite Boston-based movie? Before you answer, I'm going to interrupt you. It cannot be a mob-based film. A mob-based film. Because when I think of Boston films, I'm, I can only think of Departed and whatever the one was with Affleck and all that stuff. So what's your favorite non-mafia-based, mob-based Boston uh, movie. Well, well, that's what Boston's known for. So we really don't get much else. That and Super Bowls. Uh, <laughs> but, you used to uh, get those. I would, say, I would say this probably wasn't mob based, but was it was the name of the movie Spectacle Island, or um, the, the the one that was actually filmed on one of the Boston islands that had, uh, you know, a mental illness institution. And Kelly, you were just saying that was one of your favorites too, right? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So I, I don't the, know that one. Was that Spectacle Island or was it, what was the name of it? Shutter Island. Oh, I know. Shutter Island, DiCaprio. Shutter Island. Yes. 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 Okay. I, I, that's actually on my list. So now I'll have to check it out. But, but, but just a fun fact, there is actually a Spectacle Island out there on in Boston Harbor. And, and you can actually see the buildings on Long Island where that movie was filmed. And I spent a lot of time out there boating, so it's very interesting to see. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Your favorite Boston sports rivalry? Ooh, Boston sports rivalry. Well, I, if you go back to my childhood, it's Red Sox-Yankees. And, you know, I would root for any, I root for the Red Sox and anybody playing against the Yankees. So I, I guess that's still the case, even though I'm not as emotional about it as I used to be. Ever since yeah. the ever since the Red Sox came back from being three games down in two thousand four, I got over that. You're not bitter anymore. I I, I don't know your age, but I, are we talking like Yastrzemski, Jackson? Oh era? Yeah. yes, Yastrzemski, Fred Lynn, Jim Rice, Rico Petroselli, Dwight Evans, you name it. Kelly, you live in Corpus Christi, Texas. What's your favorite Texan food? Uh. I don't know if this counts, but tacos, <laughs> that's what came to mind. Uh, no, actually, uh, I would have to say Texas barbecue brisket. It's all about the, the, the brisket. Got to control that smoke. Love it. Right. Love it. And you just got a dog. I know in the past year, what's your dog's name? Clark. Clark named after Clark Kent. Clark, uh, Griswold. <laughs> oh, <laughs> there we go. That's Chicago based, but that's a good film as well. All right, last rapid fire, and then we'll get into the meat of things. Jeff, who's your favorite employee at Slap Five? <laughs> Ooh, I would have to be my my employee in Corpus Christi, Texas, uh, <laughs> but I don't remember her name. Uh, no, I don't know. Susan is a bit of a contractor, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so that, that that's an unfair question because we we only hire the cream of the crop, so they're they're just all wonderful. I have to there be politically go. correct. There we go. Uh, that, I suppose that's a good segue, actually, a reminder to me. I don't think I introduced uh, your role. So Jeff is the co-founder and CEO of Slap5, and Kaylee is the director of revenue growth at Slap5. Jeff, why don't you, you tell us quickly about Slap5 so that context for this conversation on customers? Well, so Slap5, the, the idea for Slap5 came from work I was doing years ago at Forrester Research, where I was both an analyst covering the space of customer marketing, customer engagement, customer experience for B2B companies, as well as uh, they asked me to run marketing for Forrester. And I created this for phenomenally successful customer engagement program that I was using to drive customer-led growth, but there was no technology out on the market to help automate that. So it was very labor intensive. And so that was what gave me the idea to create an end-to-end -end customer marketing and advocacy platform that could automate all the key workflows that customer marketers have to worry about, whether it's customer content, customer program management, 
customer advocacy, customer reference management, as well as customer insights. And so that's what Slab 5 has done over the last six years is, is create that end-to-end -end platform. And, and it's such an important part, your product and, and, and the service you're providing uh, is such an important part of customer-led growth, which to me, customer this is just a term that I recently started applying. I think I'm late in the game. And for me, the rationale was, you know, there's all this buzz about product-led growth. I was at Saster last year, and all you hear from Jason Lemkin and everybody is product-led growth, PLG, and if you just slap product-led growth on on the sticker, you know, on your your slide deck, you get a 10x valuation from the VCs, right? I, I work very closely in the customer success field. And we're trying to rise the tide of CS, right? And, and bring it more influence and, and, and other domains like customer marketing as well. And so I think we have to label it somewhere. And for me, it came from this place of like, just label it. And instead of PLG, let's label it CLG. Um, but honestly, I'm a little bit of an imposter because I don't really know what, what customer led growth is. I, I think you're much more educated on this. And I want to hear your definition. What is something that I've started to hear a little bit more now? What is customer led growth? Sure. So, so customer-led growth, and I've been using it for three or four years now. And in fact, we created the customer-led initiative four years ago to, to really do some research in this space. And so, so I define it as anything you do that mobilizes your customers to help drive the strategic growth initiatives of your company. And so that's a little bit broader than what some folks are using. So there, I would say that a lot of people coming from the customer success side are using the term customer-led growth primarily and narrowly to describe the things you do to ensure retention and renewal. And you, you probably know, you know, Gainsight uses it to describe their customer success platform, but they also have a product platform that they call product-led growth. And they also have a customer community, the product that they call community-led growth. And so, um, but but we consider that all to be customer-led growth. And, and just to you know, take, for example, uh, an initiative, the strategic growth initiative might be that we've been selling into uh, a point products now, best of breed point products, but we're trying to sell now go to market with a broader solution. And so now how do we be known as a company that has a broader solution? Well, you do that by mobilizing your customers and showcasing customers that have that are using multiple of your products in a combined way, getting some mutual value out of that to start to position in their voice the fact that you are now a platform player. So that's just one example, but I've got hundreds. <laughs> <laughs> and and we'll, we'll talk about some of those examples. So um, is customer-led growth right now being underappreciated, underserved? Are, are executives doing everything that they should be already to mobilize, as you say, their customers? Well, well that's a great question because I don't think they are. And because I had that hypothesis, Kay Kaylee and I decided to do some research on that. So she's got some data that she can give you, but the, the general statement there is that they're not. I, we believe and we've experienced from conversations that I have from CEOs and other executives that they're not recognizing the full potential that customers have to help them drive growth. They tend to think about customer marketing and what can customers do for us as primarily case studies, customer references and happy quotes. But that's, we call those the keep the lights on activities. And so if you, to really get into what customer led growth is, the way you know if you're doing customer led growth or not is if you are, what you're doing is you're having conversations with your C-level executives about what are the most important strategic growth initiatives that they have, that they're mandating for the company. And then you're coming up with programs that align and mobilize your customers in very creative ways to help address those initiatives, to help streamline them, to help accelerate them in the market, and to help overcome any obstacles or objections that you're experiencing in the market when you're trying to pursue those strategic growth initiatives. That, that sounds a lot more interesting than, than, than case studies and testimonials that that let's truth be told, like we write, not the actual customer, right? So, uh, so, so what are what are some like what's an example? And, and Kaylee, I want to get to that research, and maybe you can chime in on this one. Um, but what's an example of some of those strategic initiatives that align with the executive's top priorities that you can create? Right. Yeah. So, so think about top priorities in, in a lot of companies in the SaaS world where we all play. 
uh, nobody's got the retention rate that they believe. And it might be a lot of reasons. One, it might be because of poor adoption and usage. One might be because of poor value realization. One, I mean, there could be a lot of reasons for it. And so usually a, a companies that are struggling with poor retention, they will have, would have diagnosed what's causing the problem. And I'll give you a great example. When I was at Forrester, this was one of our challenges. People were renewing at fewer seats each year. And so we knew that the way that we were gonna increase wallet share at renewal time is we needed to get our users, our subscribers, using more of the services that they had been purchasing from Forrester. So we ran a customer-led growth initiative to capture the stories of the power users of, of Forrester's services, people doing um, inquiries that were really helping them with their initiatives, people that were using our research products, people that were coming to our events. And we would have them talk about how the different Forrester services were helping them catapult their careers further. And then we would use those and push those out, not to the public, we would push those out to the laggards, the people in our installed base, which we could see from our records, were not adopting and using the services that they subscribe to. And lo and behold, we, we started doing that with one customer, I can't name them, but we ended up tripling the size of the annual contract value with that customer because of the fact that we had the champions within that account showcase what they were doing to uh, to their peers across all the other business units and functional areas of that company. It, it just clicked for me. So I had a conversation last week with a friend of mine. I'm just going to say it. Ryan Seams, he's the head of, of customer success at Mixpanel. And if you know anything about Mixpanel, what you think about it as like an enterprise sales, which it is um, company in many ways where you, you sell the analytics solution. But he views it as a PLG company where you have lots of individual users that are each going into Mixpanel for their self-service type of analytics. And he's looking for, he said, Josh, if you can solve this problem, you know, this, this is what I want. I will buy this in a heartbeat. If you can find for me the current power users and predict the other power users of our product, because mm -hmm. I know that they're, they're the central node. And they're the ones that, they're, that, are, that get called over when we were all working in the same room. They get called over to the desk to ask, hey, how do I do this? Teach me, what do you think about this, this, this solution? And then they spread that out from within the organization. And I think that's what you're talking about. That's one example, right? Of right. Like, find those internal power users, those champions, and get them to just infiltrate and spread out you know, that, that expansion. So that just clicked for me. I'd never actually thought about customer marketing as being something internal for a company that's already, um, you know, that's already using your product. I think about it just as like, again, like the case study you slap on the website. Um, yeah, but if but you yeah. think about it, one of the biggest challenges or roadblocks that customer marketers hit is all the permission hoops that they have to go through with their enterprise accounts to get permission to use their voice. Well, then here's a perfect case where you don't need their permission to use it publicly. You just say, hey, can I have permission to use this content within your own company? <laughs> and, yeah. and I'm going to do it by making you look like a rock star. And, yeah. and, and so you can brag about your success and, you know, you're helping yourself as much as you're helping us. Yeah. So, so that's, a, that's a great example. But again, in, in customer-led growth, it can apply to initiatives around, you know, adoption, around usage, around expansion around retention and renewal, around new customer acquisition. It could help with all those things. It can also help with innovation. And so I'll give you one more example. Earlier in my career, I was at a company called Open Market, a pioneer in the e-commerce space. In fact, we have the patents on the shopping cart. And so we, um, we, we were, uh, I was charged with taking a portfolio of products and packaging them up into a solution for B2B e-commerce. And so in order to do that, we, we were only, we had only sold to consumer companies before. The whole product was built for consumer companies. We didn't have a lot of knowledge within the company about what's needed. And so I convened a steering committee of some of our uh, most important and, and strategic companies that were in the manufacturing space to help have them tell us, hey, you're already using our content management and product catalog product. We now want you to use our e-commerce product Tell us what it would have to do to meet your needs. And that yeah. was phenomenally successful on the innovation side, but we never would have been able to define this, build the missing pieces, build the connective tissue to bring all these components together, and then launch it in the market with any kind of credibility 
if we hadn't brought those people together to help us innovate and and discover what, what it really needed to do. And I, Kelly, what are you seeing? Yeah, so I think that's such an important point that I was hoping that we would bring up, um, which is, you know, customers are really at the heart of customer-led growth. And, you know, what actually introduced Jeff and I was doing customer research. And so we're huge believers in the fact that, you know, a bunch of executives sitting in a room cannot come up with the best solution for their clients without actually having some customers involved in those conversations. And so in terms of, you know, how to actually mobilize these customers um, and also what they're looking to do and accomplish themselves, which is a big part of c c kind of driving some of these advocacy types of activities. Um, all of that really, you know, has to come directly from, and I'll plug Jeff, your book's name, um, directly from the horse's mouth. Um, you know, we, you have- Jeff, you wrote a book? Well, ebook. Yeah. <laughs> ebook, okay, e we'll, get, we'll, get, we'll, get, we'll get to that later. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you, it has to start with conversations with customers about what's important to them as individuals. And then that can help to, you know, determine how you will align, you know, their goals to the strategic growth initiatives of the organization. Um, and that's the starting place for operationalizing um, some of that, you know, uh, customer advocacy and and really creating a program that enables these customers to gain value from the organization um, and enough so that they will go out and sing your praises sometimes without even prompting <laughs> um, and definitely without needing something like a, a, a monetary incentive to do so. Um, just having That's those awesome. customers involved. In, what was that? Also known as a bribe. Right. Yeah, uh, bribery doesn't work. Right. Bribery but, but Kayla, doesn't work. Say, yeah, Kayla, Kayla, you've got some good data points that goes back to the point about how executives are not really recognizing the true potential of their customers from, from the research that we did around the state of the customer marketing profession. Mm -hmm. you yeah. Talk about those? We came at at this question from an interesting angle by actually asking customer marketers about uh, their perceptions of their current roles um, at their organizations. And so what we found was people who are at companies that aren't empowering their employees to value the customers, who aren't giving resources to um, departments like customer marketing and customer success, um, and people who are at companies where they're not able to align with folks who are in the customer success um, realm, who are trying to do these customer advocacy activities, those folks all want to leave their current jobs. <laughs> they're not looking to stick around um, because they feel that the executives don't value um, their programs. And so um, even among you know, companies who clearly slightly understand the importance of customer marketing so much that they have carved out a, a role or multiple roles with individuals who are working in those um, fields, you know, even those organizations um, don't really have that full alignment between executives around, you know, the value that customer marketing can bring to the table. And they instead view, you know, these tactical keep the lights on activities as being the, you know, niche of a customer marketer, you know, we want you to create case studies. You know, we heard a lot of people in the research talk about, uh, you know, not being able to work on strategic initiatives that they would like to be doing because they are directed um, and sort of forced to keep just producing case study after case study. Um, and so there's certainly a disconnect uh, in the space, even from companies who kind of talk the talk of being customer centric. Um, there's certainly a disconnect. So a couple things there. Are you guys saying that case studies don't matter? That, that like is obviously customer marketing is so much more than case studies. Um, do, but if you do check the boxes, do those things help? What we generally think of as just the, those table stakes activities? 
Yeah, well, you, you use the right word. They're table stakes. Yeah, you have to do them. You have to you have to be generating the case studies because that gives you proof that you've got customers in this segment or this industry. And uh, we strongly believe, though, that the classic case study that is challenge solution results format with a happy quote in the sidebar that's written <laughs> by a third party writer who doesn't know your product or your customers, and it's full of marketing speak. We don't believe those are useful to anybody. And all of the buyer research that I've done over the last 20 years shows that buyers don't want to read those. They don't like those. And plus, they don't differentiate a company. And so, you know, so we believe that a case study needs to be in the first person, customer's voice. We prefer video, which is why we've built the, the video capability in Slot 5 to do things like recorded customer references and what we call case study 2.0. And, and then also, you need to have customers talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly about being a customer. Because if you think about it, when a buyer is trying to, uh, you know, when they're evaluating and buying a technology, a big ticket purchase, they're going to do customer reference calls. And and Josh, can you can you tell me, can you guess what the number one most frequently asked question is on customer reference calls across every technology segment? Were, were you happy with the product? Uh, no, it, it, no. I mean, th that's a common one. That's a very common one. But the number one most frequently asked question is what went wrong? Like, mm. like what challenges or pitfalls have you hit and how did you get through them? Because every buyer knows that things are going to go wrong, but they want to know that the vendor is going to be there to support them when things do get wrong, go wrong, and they're going to be able to get through that. And so they want to know that. They, they, they want to know the gotchas. And, uh, but when, when was the last time you saw a case study that talked about what went wrong? Yeah. 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 And so that's why, you know, what we call a case study 2.0. That's one of the questions we ask customers when we're interviewing them for this is tell, tell us what, what was your implementation process like? And then what went well and what went wrong? What would you do differently if you were to start over? I love that. In business school, I took a course on, on, um, like persuasion principles and psychology and, forget the name of it, but it was like the converted testimonial or something. It, it, basically somebody who used to have a negative view of your brand, but you were able to convert them. An example I think would be the, um, the, the sprint guy. Can you hear me now? What was, what, would, what was he first on Verizon and then sprint or sprint and then Verizon, but like the, the converted person, right? Who, so somebody in this case, maybe that's not exactly um, the same example, but, but somebody in this case where they had something go wrong, they were upset, but then you, you, you saved them. And that's the hero's journey. And not only by doing that, not only did you bring them back to the level they should have been at, but you actually probably elevated them to a higher level. And, and that's where you actually get, and somebody quoted this to me recently, actually, I don't remember, I don't recall who, but that's where you get the NPS score of 10. You get the NPS right. score of nine whenever, or eight, when everything just goes kind of cool and smoothly. You get the NPS score of 10 when shit got fucked up and you were there to help bring it to the next level. And those are going to be your best advocates and they're going to have the best insights for your other buyers. But the classic customer marketer might say, we can't talk to them. They had a bad experience. I'm exactly. Like, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, what, what, why does customer marketing exist? It, it exists to create the trust gap that exists in the market between buyers and sellers. And when I say buyers, I mean both net new logos, as well as existing customers when they're deciding whether to expand their usage, buy more products from you or renew what they've already bought, they're in buyer mode. And so you have to overcome that trust gap. That's what we're looking to do. And you can only do that with authenticity. And people, when they see these brand videos with the A-roll and B-roll music and the drone footage coming in and everything, they, they perceive those as advertisements. They're not authentic. Yeah. And when they read those case studies, that's all full of these glorious statements written by you know, a, a third party writer, um, they don't believe that. And they're like, they're disappointed because they wanted to hear what your customers had to say. Yeah. I you know, actually, I, I recently saw some, uh, some advertisements on TV that were being filmed with a iPhone in, in like the vertical position. And it was very clear that this was like organically filmed. And this is like national advertising and they're paying millions of dollars. And the person yep. is selling their widget with an iPhone recording. But it was because the nature of that product is something that like maybe you would have disbelief in and they wanted to create that authenticity. Kelly, what were you saying? Yeah, I was gonna say, I always love to draw the analogy to a 
the B2C world. I mean, we're all consumers here. And if you've purchased anything online in your lifetime, um, especially over the last, you know, 10 years, you probably, if you see only five star reviews on something on Amazon, what are you going to think? <laughs> You're going to think it's spam it's a bot, <laughs> that maybe it's not even a real product, uh, that there's just you know, it, it, people are skeptical yeah. by nature, no matter who they are and what they're buying. And I think that's, you know, what the the gap that we are wanting to bridge is that all buyers are human, even when they're buying something for their company. It doesn't change the fact that they're a skeptical human being. And if you're only showing perfection and only showing, you know, the like, number one best case scenario, uh, then that's just going to draw even more suspicion. Yeah, we're, we're drifting a little bit. That's OK, because I think this is a really interesting conversation. Um, so on that note, I actually recently read a newsletter from a marketing psychologist and she showed two examples of a photo of a hamburger. And I forget what establishment it was, some McDonald's or Burger King or something. And, you know, she had said, you know, would you guess which one was the highest converting advertisement? One of them, the, the burger was pristine. It was a perfect circle. It was, you know, beautiful. The other one, it was a little bit off. The lettuce was a little bit, you know, tilted to the side and the tomato and, and, you know, the edges of the burger were a little bit rougher. And the moral of the story was that was the one that was higher converting because it felt more authentic. And uh, so I love the approach that you guys are taking and your, your philosophy there behind that of, the, the high production value stuff, that's cool. But what really resonates more deeply with customers are perhaps the lower fidelity, more organic version versions of things. Right. Um, Kelly, what else are you seeing in the world of customer marketing? Is this a industry? So, so you mentioned the survey. And actually, the first thing I wanted to ask you is, like a survey of what, of like the 10 customer marketers that are out there? Like <laughs> how, how big is this universe? Uh, uh, obviously I'm joking here, but how big is the universe? Is it growing? Is it contracting? Um, like what are the initiatives in, that, that you're seeing to, to give it more presence and it's proper due? Yeah. So there are actually around 4,000 customer marketers and we, there's a umbrella term customer marketing and advocacy that has sort of emerged. And so we'll, we'll call them, there are around 4,000 of those uh, professionals out in the uh, B2B world. And uh, actually earlier this year, uh, I believe it was Forbes named customer, no, uh, a study was done on LinkedIn of the fastest growing jobs and customer marketing was number three on that list. Um, and so it's certainly starting to get the recognition that we have always thought that it deserves. And, the, you know, the market is sort of um, catching up to to what we have been putting out there in terms of our, our thought leadership. Um, but yet we still see some gaps. Right. So, I mean, in the customer marketing space, you know, a really big, important piece of becoming successful is uh, making sure that customers are getting value from the program that you're providing to them um, in order to not have to rely on things like bribes, um, you know, trying to pay people to participate in a video case study or to speak at your conference. You know, instead, we want and, and help our customers create a two-way exchange of value with their clients. Um, but there are still some challenges of, in doing that. And one of them is collaborating internally with teams like sales and customer success and marketing and product marketing. Um, and one of the most interesting findings from our survey of customer marketers that we just completed was that um, of all of the people who are sort of, we'll call it dissatisfied with their current job and are actually looking to move on, all of those customer marketers, 92% of them said that they don't feel connected to customer success. 
92%. Hmm. Specifically customer success as opposed to marketing or product or, or yes. sales or whatever. Exactly. Specifically, 92% said they don't feel connected to customer success. Um, and wow. we didn't see that pattern among, you know, the product marketing or the marketing teams at all. Um, and so I think that highlights a huge need for there to be a lot more collaboration between those two teams. Um, because, I mean, I think this quote that we also gathered from the survey puts it very well. They said, there is no vision for the entire end-to-end -end customer journey. Uh, the way our organization is structured, we each own a slide of the journey, which leads to competing priorities and overlapping mm -hmm. efforts. Um, that's a really important, you know, statement. And that was from somebody who had indicated they were looking to leave their job as well um, in the survey. And I think that it really just highlights the need for folks who are in this space to, you know, not only have, you know, those human connections, but also have some type of system of record so that they know what all has been done with each customer, you know, how have we interacted with these customers um, and how can we make sure that we are a keeping their best interests in mind, you know, not reaching out to folks who aren't interested in public speaking um, with those types of opportunities um, and then be, you know, ensuring that you're really aligning to what that customer's end goal is. And so we want to help, you know, not only empower these customer marketers to, you know, bridge the gaps internally um, and start to collaborate more with those teams, but also hopefully also provide uh, some technology that will facilitate that process as well. I do want to ask, um, so in your so, so your point is that we're all going back to customer led growth. It's all under the customer led growth umbrella, mm -hmm. and CS and do I call it CMNA, <laughs> customer marketing and advocacy? You know, all, all need to work together um, in, in concert. Either Jeff or Kaylee, tell me how are you guys doing it at Slap Five? <laughs> well, well, it's um, you, you know the expression it takes a village. Right. And so, so let me just preface it by saying that the it, customer marketing is one of the toughest jobs in any company because it takes a village to do it successfully. Right. You can't do customer marketing in a vacuum. You, you can't just do it without total buy in from marketing, without total buy in from customer success, without buy in from sales and not just buy in, but they need to support the program. They need to encourage it. They need to open doors to their customers as, as opposed to putting up walls. And so, so that's why it's such a challenging job, which causes people to, there's so many, so many people in the space to, to leave jobs. Now, how is Slap5 doing it? Well, we're lucky because we're a much smaller company than our clients are. And so we have, um, you know, we, we have a weekly call that, that gets, you know, all of our customer marketing, marketing and sales leaders together. Uh, we, and we go through what are the challenges, what are the initiatives we should be doing what are, you know, how could we be improving the customer experience? We're continuously making tweaks and improvements on our own customer experience. Um, we, one of the things we do is we, we make sure that we are in the sales process that we're very clearly capturing the goals and expectations of each customer such that when we hand off to, to, you know, the customer success team to now work with that customer, there's no surprises. We know exactly what they're looking to do. We've, We've 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 got that, and and you know we're we're going to help them down that path. And then there's a variety of other things too that we're doing. Kaylee, why don't why don't you talk about some of the things since you're you're one of the players in that partnership? Yeah, definitely. So I think one of the most powerful things that we do is you know making sure to have a give all of our customers a voice, not only about you know their experiences, but also about the product. Um, we do regular feedback sessions with customers when we're gonna create something new to make sure that we're keeping their needs in mind because we know that at the end of the day, uh, we live in our own worlds. <laughs> um, and so we wanna make sure to validate the things that are gonna be you know, the, the most helpful and useful with our customers. And so I think you know, by having that type of relationship where they all know that 
they are able to come up come up to us each and and provide you know feedback or hard truths or you know just have that open door of communication i think really has helped us create kind of an organic growth engine to where you know now we have our own customer marketing and advocacy community called customer x uh, where we try to empower customer marketers in every way possible, you know, whether it's through providing the research um, that we're doing or, uh, you know, recognizing them through awards. Um, you know, these are all things that that they have asked for, essentially. And, and so, you know, we work backwards from what they say they want. <laughs> and it ends up working out really well for us. Um, you know, I one of the really nice things on the customer acquisition side is being able to tell a potential client, yeah, go and look in the Slack channels and see what people say about, about Slap5, um, which yep. I think is just a really powerful thing to be able to say, you know, because we have sort of reached that point at which we really are customer growth led at, at, at this juncture, um, junction. And, you know, we see that evidence through you know, cust return customers, right? Folks who leave one organization and go to another one. And the first thing they want to do is, is bring us in. And so, um, you know, by drinking our own champagne, we are certainly sort of reaping the benefits of customer led growth. Um, and it's really just yeah. by following what we preach to others. <laughs> so, and, and Josh, you, you've worked in companies of different sizes, right? So, so, you know, the game, it, it's, it's a lot easier when you're a startup to get everybody in the same room or everybody on the same zoom call and make sure you're all aligned and everybody knows what everybody else is doing. And every company goes through the growing pains of when they start to scale, they start to lose the, that soul of their company, right? They, they have to start to now departmentalize. They have to start to now allocate more specialties to their roles. And so, you know, it's, it's a little bit unfair for, uh, you know, to compare what a company uh, like our size or your size does to what the, the typical client of Slap5 does who are, you know, they're, they're mid to large size enterprises and they're dealing with situations where they, they've grown to the point where you know, there's silos and it's really hard to break through those silos and and it's a, yeah. it's a real challenging yeah. thing. I, I don't know about you, but I think that's one of the reasons why I love uh, being an entrepreneur. <laughs> right? Yeah, no, it's absolutely. Just, it's because you can create a culture like that, but it, you know, we're both going to experience it as we continue to grow. How do you, how do you keep that culture uh, as you grow? How do you keep that openness and, and uh, everybody on the same page? Jeff Ernst, a true pioneer of customer led growth as cited on your LinkedIn profile. And my Kelly, own and your own opinion, <laughs> Kelly, driving customer-led growth through advocacy, uh, as cited on your LinkedIn profile, um, and your own opinion. You guys have been great. Uh, wishing you all the best with the growth of Slat5, with your helping to elevate customer marketing and the growth of that function. And thank you both so much for being on this episode. Thank all you. Right. Thank you for having us. Yes, glad to be here. <laughs>